Psalm 78, verses 12 to 31. Verse 19 is the text verse. What it's referring to, if you were taking notes and you want to write this down and check them out later, are the passages that are in Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Exodus 16, 1 through 5, but also Numbers chapter 11, verses 31 to 33. Is Exodus 16, 1 through 5? Second one. <laughs> Numbers 11, 31 through 33. Thank that you. is what is being spoken of in Psalm 78, where we're going to be reading, beginning at verse 12. And down to verse 31. And the word of God says, He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. And he made the waters to stand as in heat. So if you look in the back of your Bible and they you have got a map back there and they show them bypassing the Red Sea and going through the so-called Sea of Reeds, then you know your Bible publisher is an awful liar. All right. Pick it up here in verse 12. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through and he made the waters to stand as a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud and all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused the waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven, Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust, and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea, and he let it fall in the midst of their camp, round about their habitations. So they did eat, and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you Lord, for this message. And Lord, I pray, Father, again, simply use me as a means, as a tool of delivering, Lord, to your people these truths from your word. And we pray and we ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, the Jews were being led by God through Moses out of Egypt and into the desert wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula down to Mount Sinai itself. Now back in Egypt, back in the world where they had been under cruel bondage, they had had water to drink, they had had diverse foods to eat to their full, but now this church in the wilderness, this 
called out assembly, that's in Acts 7.38 is where you find that, has been separated away from the world. And all of its members are having withdrawals. Hey, didn't we have it good back in Egypt? <laughs> Can you imagine them saying that? Do you remember the flesh pots and the fresh bread? How about the fish fries and the leeks and the onions and the garlic that we ate to our fill? Yeah, boy, oh boy, those were some good old days back in Egypt. Okay? Ecclesiastes 7.10 Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Short memories these Jews had. Serving with rigor, the scripture said. Past masters with wits. And Pharaoh attempting to breed out an entire people by ordering that their baby boys be killed so that eventually the Hebrew girls would have to marry Egyptian men. Just a lovely time they were having back there in Egypt. Hey Moses! Hey Moses! All we have to eat is this manna that God sends us free of charge. <laughs> Every day. I mean, sure, it tastes pretty good, this light bread, as they call it. And we feel full. We have plenty of strength, but man wouldn't, what I wouldn't give, man, for a 24 ounce medium rare prime rib you know, with mushrooms and au jus sauce, a loaded baked potato. <laughs> and after that, a great big slice of fresh apple pie with a scoop of vanilla ice cream on top. Mmm, <coughs> boy. <laughs> hey, Moses! We had all that back in Egypt. But here in this wilderness, man, we're living on bread and water. And what are we? Slaves? Prisoners? Bread and water, three times a day, every day. Now, if God is God, I mean, he brought water out of a rock. Why can't he spice up the menu a little bit here? You know, how about some variety? Can God provide a table in the wilderness? <laughs> I mean, we read that. And yeah, that's what comes out of Man, what is wrong with these Jews? But I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, this is Christianity today. So God gives them what they asked, read, whined for, verses 27 through 31. <coughs> he, he gives it <coughs> to them. He rained flesh. I mean, he just didn't send a few birds there. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls like as the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the midst of their camp. They didn't even have to go hunting for it. Round about their habitation. So they did eat and were well filled for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths, they're chewing on that first big juicy bite, yeah, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. God gave them their own desire. And there should be a great big sign on danger, 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 you know. Uh, you better be careful about your desires. 
said they were not estranged from their lust. Okay? They still had an affinity and a friendship, a love with the lusts and desires of the world that they had had when they were in Egypt. That's Christianity today. You know, we'll say, you know, be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. You know? I mean, that, you know, breaking off that first, well, I mean, those drumsticks aren't very big if anybody's ever seen a quail. You know, they're not that big a bird. You know, kind of like the, what do they call those uh, little small, small chickens? That Cornish hen. Cornish hen, yeah. And they're, they're, they're not big, okay? They're bigger than a pigeon, but not by much. But, you know, I mean, that first drumstick, he's going to get ready, boy, and fighting, oh, yeah, this is, this is going to be good. You know, I mean, before he even gets the first piece of meat stuck between the teeth, God strikes him, you know, sends along, and a uh, uh, plague that starts killing people. Psalm 106. Psalm 106, verse 13, 14, 15. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request. Yeah. Okay. You want this? I'll give it. And sent leanness in their souls. Man, if ever I heard a description of the majority of so-called Bible-believing Christianity today is that it right there. And a leanness in their souls. The primary purpose of man, once again, yeah, here he goes again, the primary purpose of man is to give glory to God. Therefore, the primary need of man, certainly not his desire, certainly not what he's lusting after, is the ability to give glory to God. In Philippians 4.19 it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now God has promised to supply all your need. And he is, I mean, this is the almighty creator who has created all that exists. So I don't think he's going to have any problem supplying all your need. Number one, all. Okay. All your needs, yours, you in specific, your needs, not your greed, <laughs> not your desire, not your lusts. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways, Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Back in Psalms again, Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And he's going to give you what to desire. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Now, it does not matter who you are, and it does not matter where you are. It does not matter whether you can see what you need, or how to acquire 
what you need. As God is both the provider and he is the means of acquiring what the need is and he will give you the desires of your heart. He's the one who determines what your need is. As the purpose is his glory, not your desires. And that's when he says there, I will give you the desires of your heart. He's not saying, whatever you desire, I'm going to, no, I'm going to cause you to desire what it is you need. See, the problem is how people see God. Do they see God as an end or do they see God as a means? See, the world of religion will tell you that God exists to make man happy. That's why God exists, to make you happy. The Bible says that man exists to glorify God. The world and religion say that the end of all things is the happiness of man. The Bible says that the end of all things is the Lord God. Can man be happy? Sure. But the happiness is a byproduct. Okay, It's not the prime product. Happiness is a byproduct of the will of God. It's not the prime product. The prime product is the will of God. But Brother Wes used to say it, and I continue to say it. His preacher, Brother Utley, used to say it. God doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about your holiness, because it's your holiness okay, that speaks to God's glory. God to be holy because I am holy. Is there happiness in Christianity? Of course there is. But it's the byproduct of fulfilling the purpose and the will of God, which is the glory of God. When you treat God as a means, you know, gift dispenser, you know, when you refer to God, you know, treat God like he's a bubble gum machine put my prayers in and God's going to spit out double bubble gum for me, you know, it's like how come this thing isn't giving me what I want. Uh, you treat God as a means and not as the end, then you're thinking like the world, Christian. John chapter 12, verse 28, Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. He says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Christ in prayer to, the, to God the Father in Luke 22, 42 said, Not my will, but thine be done. As a man, and the Lord Jesus Christ surrendered his will to the Father. Go to Matthew 24 with me. Matthew 24, verse 37, 38, 39. Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the son of man be Luke 17 Luke 17 at verse 26 As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, 
They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Marrying, giving in marriage until they were all destroyed, you know. Just going on and living this life and the things of this life, the concerns of this life. Worldly concerns, worldly pursuits. Matthew 6 this time, verse 24. Matthew 6, verse 24 to 34. Down to the end of the chapter. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Try as you will. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Sure, to live is Christ. <laughs> this morning's message. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Let your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? <coughs> Excuse me. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles see. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I can't tell you the number of times that God has provided for Kathy and I are you know, we've learned not to worry about stuff. You know, and again, I, I look at how we live in this country. You know, and and I say this to my shame. I can go to my closet, and I've probably got more clothes in my closet than any dozen people, any dozen brothers or sisters in Christ do. In a lot of places in the world, I mean, there we have brothers and sisters in Christ that probably have, you know, one at best, maybe two sets of clothing. Right. They have what they need. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the difference. See? Those that treat God as the means of acquiring things and not the end of things. Okay. I hear they're saying, yeah, you know, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? It's like, you know, good night. Yeah. He just destroyed Egypt with plague that you saw. Many of them, God separated between you and Egypt in those plagues. 
You just walk through the middle of the Red Sea with the walls of water standing up on either side. Now when you had nothing to drink, God brought water out of a rock in the middle of the desert for you to drink. Yeah. Well, can he provide a... That's like, what are you making? Yeah. It's like we see God's hand in our lives again and again and again and again, but then a difficulty comes along, a little bump in the road comes along, and it's like, where are you, God? Why are you abandoning me? Yeah. <laughs> Christ said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, the spiritual. Get your priorities right. And his righteousness and all these things will be added unto now God said it. God said it. I mean, so don't be shy about holding it up to him, saying, Father, I've been trying to live for you and do what's right and see and you know, I have this very real need. And you said right here in your word. Yeah, that if I sought first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, that you would add all these things unto me. I mean, he's your father. You got the right. You know, it's what you know, a lot of folks don't do that. You know, it's one of the things I loved about Moses. Every time God wanted to kill Israel and wipe them out, I can't blame God. <laughs> I get frustrated with him. You know, and Moses would say, But God, remember you said this and you promised this and if you do this, then the world's going to say that, you know. Okay. Hold it up to them. I mean, that's that, that's the great power of knowing that you've got God's perfectly preserved word, that these are what God said. Well, God, you said this. And that's what I've been counting on. That's what I walk by every day. You know. Now, don't be not obeying the word of God and think that you're going to go and hold the word of God up under his nose. Well, you know, he'll be saying, yeah, I did say that, but I also said, <laughs> you know, uh, he will smack you back with that, trust me. You know? I mean, did not God provide in the wilderness 40 years of manna out of heaven? 40 years. You know, you go in to Joshua, and the, you know, the day after they entered into Canaan, then it stopped. Forty years without fail, every morning, six days a week, and twice as much on Saturday or on, on Friday. God provided. Says those that gathered little had no lack. Those that gathered over, you know. You know. <laughs> 40 years, water. They were someplace where there was no oasis, where there was no brook, where there was no city. Water out of the rock. Water out of the rock for them. Fresh, clear, clean, cold water. 40 years. I mean, they couldn't have run down to the clothing store. They couldn't run down to the shoe store. They couldn't, no, 40 years. Clothing and shoes didn't wear out. Clothing and shoes that grew with you. Yeah. Yeah. Forty years of his presence. Yeah. Every day. That cloud that covered him over. Yeah. Protecting him from the sun. That pillar cloud that they could follow. Yeah. Every night that pillar of a cloud turned into a pillar of fire there for light and for protection and for comfort for 40 years. 40 years of protection, 40 years of safety. Didn't matter who it was. Didn't matter where they were. God provided their need just as he said he would. Yeah, and one of the big things I see amongst Christians 
is how, well, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I have, because I've got to provide for this and I've got to take care of that and I, 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 and it's like, no. Try to do it with your wisdom by your means. Your be- you know, and instead of putting God first in your life. Say, well, you know, that's got to wait because I've got to go take care of this and I've got to do this and I, you know, and if I don't if I don't do it, nobody No. Put God first. Put God first. Yeah. When you get up in the morning, okay, He's first. You get up in the morning. It's prayer. It's the Bible. Okay? The other stuff can wait. Do that first. Put Him first in everything that you do in life. You know, go that well, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, go to church because I gotta do this. I can't go soul winning because I've gotta do this. I can't do you know, you're not putting God first. Put him first. Guarantee you the other stuff will get taken care of. Guarantee. You know, again, it's Revelation three seventeen. It's exactly what it is, because thou sayest I am rich. And I am increased in good and have need of nothing. Not because God gave it to me, because I did it. I did it, right? And know it's not. Okay. Blind, deceived by will. That thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Those are all present tense things. Examine your motives. I mean, the Jews in the wilderness, when they're asking for, you know, this meat, you know, here they've got herds of cattle, huge flocks of sheep and goats. <laughs> you know? Well, I don't want to bite into my wealth here. <laughs> really? You know? Can God provide a table in the well? I mean, you didn't have any of the cattle and sheep and goats and all that stuff when you were in Egypt. You were slaves. <laughs> you know? Examine your motives. Do you see God as the end or simply as the means? Do you strive? To glorify God, or does God exist for you simply as the provider of your wants and desires? You're regardless of how it affects him, and it affects him. I want to tell you, your behavior towards God affects him. You think he wasn't hurt 